2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. And then we may read a little, little around that because, uh, you know, sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, it's always good to get in uh, the context of something. So we'll just really to back up here. My main verse is verse 7. Let's back up to verse 1 and read this in context. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Now you just go, go look it up in the Greek, homosexual. Okay. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. It didn't say it ordained them as bishops. It said turn away from them. For of this sort are they which crept into houses and lead silly uh, captives, silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs was also, uh, also was. Praise the Lord. Verse seven, where it says here, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The word truth here is epinosis in the Greek, and uh, you can you know you can uh, there's different definitions, but you know um, Vines says it denotes exact or full knowledge, discernment or recognition, the clear, precise, experiential knowledge of the things of God. Now, I just added that part in. A greater participation by the knower in the object known, thus more powerfully influencing him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, Paul, uh, Paul writing here says, people, there's a group of people that are always learning, but never able to come to that clear, precise, accurate, and experiential knowledge of God. Now, I will say this, you know, in context here, he's talking about a bunch of people, you know, all these people who are, who are uh, having a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. We, we live in a time where you got people who go to church. They say, oh, I'm a Christian. Then, then all they can talk about is getting drunk, uh, you know, cussing, sex, homosexuals are okay, abortion's okay, but I'm a liberal Christian or whatever. Yet the Word of God here says that there are those who have that form of godliness but deny His power. And then he goes on and says, and these are people who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. For the believer, it is imperative that we come into the epinosis of God. We need to come into the full, clear, precise, and accurate knowledge of God. And, and we're not just talking about, you know, um, spiritual. We're talking about your mind being renewed. We're talking to you and come into that full counsel of the, of the, of the epinosis of God. That is E-P-I-G-N-O-S-I-S is a transliteral lettering for, from the Greek to the English. So we would pronounce it epinosis. That is not the Greek letters, but it's E-P-I-G-N-O-S-I-S. -I -I Where does the knowledge of God come from? Let me say this. It comes from the Scripture. I uh, recently had a short debate, because you can't debate with, with people who are, uh, um, I want to be nice. But when you start denying the scriptures as the word of God, there is no debate. You cannot debate spiritual things with people who do not accept the scripture as the word of God. There, because there has to be, because what happens then, if the scriptures are not the word of God, amen, are you here? If the scriptures are not the word of God, then... Um, it becomes what you think or what you feel, what you hear. You know, some impulse, some whatever. There's nothing to measure it against. And so we understand, let's first of all start with the fact that Scripture is the Word of God. Everybody say, Scripture is the Word of God. Look over in um, this same book, and we'll move on further down. And... Um, verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. 
and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration. God breathed of God and is profitable. Underline that, that term and is profitable. Underline all scripture and then underline is profitable. All scripture is what? Is profitable. Hallelujah. Four, and then Paul lists four things that it's profitable for. Um, for telling us that we don't have to do anything, we have no responsibility, we live in la-la land, we can do anything we want to do, it doesn't matter because we're all, uh, we're all going to heaven. Is that what he said? No. He said, for, I find it interesting that he said for, of, the, of the first things he said that all scripture is given um, uh, is given by, by inspiration of God, or, by, or is God breathed, God impulsed into the writer, and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Now, it's pretty interesting you find here that 50% is what some people refer to as a positive view on the profitability, and 50% is on a negative view. I find that interesting. What about you? Because with, there would be those who would lead us to believe that God never deals with us and reproves us. God never corrects us. We're never to self-examine ourselves. We're never to judge ourselves. We're never to do anything like that because we're just to look at the finished work of Jesus. Yet the Word of God says that the Scriptures are profitable to reprove and to correct. Amen. If you're ever going to come to the clear, precise, accurate, and full experiential knowledge of the things of God and of God himself, you're going to have to accept that all Scripture was God-breathed. And if it's God-breathed, if, you know, if it's God-ordained, if it's God-breathed uh, to be given to mankind, then whatever his Word says is applicable to our lives. Did you know the study of the Word of God's number one purpose is to make it applicable to your life? To find its application and how it works in our life. It is not so you can argue the next guy. It's not so you can have scripture wars on, on the internet or on television or on the radio. It is so that you can find from the word of God how God's word instructs us, commands us, gives examples of how we are to live in Christ. It, the Word of God is given in a way that it is for doctrine. In other words, what we believe. Now, I had somebody tell me recently that, you know, the Bible uh, is really not God's Word. Jesus is the Word. And you don't have to have a Bible. You can live just as successfully for God and, and, and live in the fullness of the things of God without the Bible as you can with one uh, because, because of the Holy Spirit in us. Yet the Scripture says all Scripture is given for the purpose of creating doctrine. It teaches us what we believe. I said it teaches us what we believe. It, it reproves us. Are you here? Scripture reproves Now, I'm not, see, we're, we can't, we're not going to use the term word because we'll go back to Jesus is the word, the Logos. But here it says scripture. So the scripture is profitable to reprove people. The scripture is profitable to correct. Now, see, there's a difference between correction and reproof. Reproof comes when people are unrepentant. You know, can you see that? Reproof comes when people are unrepentant. In other words, they know what they're doing is wrong, and, and, you, and the Bible reproves them. It is a rebuke for not repenting and doing the right thing. Correction is someone who's doing something, and they don't know it's wrong, and the Bible corrects that action. See? So reproof is for the unrepentant. Correction is for somebody who's, who's doing it wrong and doesn't know it. There's a, there's a difference. And then for instruction in righteousness. So it tells us the, the Word of God, Scripture, the Scripture is, is given to teach us what to believe. What is our doctrine? You know, the doctrine of Christ. It's given to reprove the unrepentant. If you're going to live in adultery and fornication and live openly in those things, the Word of God's going to reprove you. Hello? Somebody out there wave at me and let me know you're breathing. Amen. All right. Thirdly, it will correct those who don't know they're doing wrong. In other words, I mean, they may be doing something they're not really sure, but the Bible comes and says, no, don't do this. It brings correction. And then fourth, instruction in righteousness. What? It tells you how to live. 
Now you can't read the New Testament and not, and not come out away from there going, well, the Bible says to live this way. It tells you not to do certain things. Him that stole, still no more. We went through this in the book of Ephesians, which we haven't finished yet. We're going to continue working on finishing this Sunday. Hallelujah. But uh, it, it's a, there's, there's a litany of things to do and not to do in the New Testament that are instructions in how the righteous live. That are instructions and in what you should be doing since you're born again, the life of God's in you, this is how you should be acting. Amen. Now, if it was automatic, Paul would not have written to the church and said, I buffet my body daily. I keep it under. He would not have written and said, offer your body a living sacrifice, which is your reason. Now, King James uses the term reasonable, which if we go do just a real shallow study, it only take a real deep study to get this one right. You, go, you find really that word should be translated or better translated in, modern, in our modern times in the language we speak today, spiritual service. Offer your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is your spiritual service. And so, um, if, if it was automatic, you got born again, it was automatic, Paul wouldn't have to buffet his body. He said, I buffet it daily. He wrote to the church and said, put off the old man and put on the new man. Hello? So, we are instructed in the Word of God. Now, listen, your body didn't get born again. How many found that out? When, when 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says old things have passed away and all things have become new and all things are of God, it's talking about your spirit. It's not talking about your mind. You didn't get a new mind. How do you know that? Because the Bible tells us to renew our mind with the washing of the water of the Word. Amen. Be, 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 uh, <laughs> Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. If your mind was brand new, you wouldn't need to renew it. If your body had gotten saved, you wouldn't have to keep it under. Paul said he buffets it. He did not say he buffets it daily. He buffets it daily. Now, some of us like to buffet our body daily. Golden Corral today, Ruby Tuesdays and all you can eat lunch bar tomorrow. Shoney's all you can eat breakfast bar on Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings. You know, uh, whoever else has got an all you can eat, go over to, to, to Grand Over Sunday brunch and all you can eat brunch. Uh, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot of places you can buffet your body at, but that's not what Paul said. He said he buffets it. He beats it. He keeps it under. He keeps it under control. Why? Because the Scripture has given him instructions, or him and us. The Scripture has given us instructions in righteousness. How do we conduct ourselves as believers? Hello? Now, it won't save you, but you're supposed to conduct yourself that way. If you're born again, this is how you're supposed to conduct yourself. In other words, God still sets a standard of how you are to conduct yourself as a believer. Amen. You can't say, I'm born again, I'm under the blood, I'm going to commit all the adultery I want to commit. It don't matter. It does matter. And the Word of God instructs us in how to conduct our life. And how to carry our life home. And so there, there's where this self-examination comes in. You, you judge yourself through the scripture. What do I believe? What, is the, well, what does the Bible say? You get, your, you get your doctrine from the, the scriptures. When you're living one way and the preacher gets up and preaches a sermon and it reproves you, then you're to repent for that. And get it out. You know, I know in 1 John 1, 9 does apply to the church. He was writing to the church. Amen. The Bible talks about godly sorrow working repentance. Hello. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Correcting and then instructing in righteousness. So the scripture is given by God to aid us. It is, it is God. Um, uh, uh, who said this? I'm trying to think of the, the, uh, the, the church it's, old, it's older church uh, leader years, I mean decades ago, centuries ago. But he said this, he said prayer, now listen, you, you just take this for what it's worth. You can, you, sometimes when people say stuff, you've got to take it for a grain of salt, the, the, the context of what they're saying it in, but there's a principle here. Prayer is us talking to God, the Word is God talking to us. 
Do we commune with God by prayer? Yes, he does speak to our spirit. But he primarily is going to speak to you from what? The scripture. Do not become so dependent on hearing things. Because what's, what's going to happen? The spirit of God, the still small voice, is going to speak in line with the word of God. He's not going to disagree with the written word of God. And that is the danger in, in um, abdicating the, the authority of the word of God out of people's lives that you simply have the Holy Spirit within us. And I'm not, I'm not demeaning the role of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit works in conjunction with, he's the author of the book. He's not going to, he's not going to tell you something that's different from the book, but how are you going to know if it's the Holy Spirit unless you've got a book or something to judge it by? Well, I just felt like it was right. I had a lot of people tell me that they felt like it was right when you went to the Bible. They said, they, they said God told me. God told me to go out and, and uh, that, that man was going to be my husband. Oh, really? Yeah, he gave me a dream. Show me that man's my husband. Really? Well, why aren't you talking to your pastor about this? I can't. Why can't you? Well, I just can't. Well, is anybody else, you know, any others in the church you can talk to them about it? No, I can't talk to them about it. Why can't you? I just can't. Well, has this fellow shown any interest in you at all? Well, no, he's married. Now, they were convinced God told them they were going to marry that man. Yet the Bible <laughs> talks about lusting after another's uh, spouse, talks about committing, you know, uh, that, that, that uh, look at someone lust after them, commit adultery already, that God hates divorce. You hear you're going home. So, you know, don't, t don't come to me and God shows you you're going to marry some, some man that's married. I mean, somebody that's going to marry you and they're already married to somebody else. That violates the word. Well, how would you know that unless you had the written scripture to go by that? Because if we start abdicating the authority of the written word, then what happens is we come up and then whatever people hear or whatever they feel. And what you end up with is, is Christian situational ethics. Because whatever whim they get in, in their little whatever, their, it's not their spirit, it's their head. But whatever whim comes, whatever voice speaks to them, that's God. And they run off and act on it, and uh, there's nobody that you can't judge them. Oh, you can't judge them? They're hearing from heaven. God spoke to them. Well, I'm sorry, the scripture says this, and what they're doing is violates the scripture. Well, we don't receive that. You know, God, the, the Bible is only there to point us to, to Jesus in us. Well, I'm sorry, I, I, I disagree with that. The Bible says it's, it's, it's profitable to do, for doctrine, for proof, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. Amen. Y'all here? <laughs> there, I'm, I'm going to read some of the scriptures on the scriptures. <laughs> I like that. Hallelujah. Um, and, and, they, and, they may, and they're not really going to apply to a point as much as they, I want to show you that the Bible refers to the Scripture in, in an authoritative uh, paradigm. In other words, the Scripture has authority. Galatians 3, and uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Galatians 3, 22. But the Scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to all them that believe. Galatians 4.30. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. 1 Timothy 5.18. For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. I want to stop right there. Um, let me show you something. Because I was in, in a discussion with somebody recently about, you know, and they said, what, what, is your, what, what, are your, what is your view of what the Word of God is? Well, it says the Bible. No, it's not. They don't accept the Bible as the Word of God. It's a good book, good book to be read. But there are people without Bibles. And, you know, because they don't have Bibles, then the, 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 the way they have to have is the knowledge that, that Jesus in them will teach them and lead them and guide them in everything they're supposed to do. Now, so now Paul, Paul didn't write that. James didn't write that. Peter didn't write that. John didn't write that. And, they, and then one, another guy chimed in and says, the, the writers, the, the people, the, the, the apostles didn't have a Bible. Okay. okay. Boy, when you, when you sell out to something and, and make something your, your narrative of life and you got to make everything fit it, you come up with some whacked out stuff. In other words, once you take something out of context and you try to make everything fit it, then you have to, you start creating 
an un, what I like to use this term, untenable paradigm for believing. Because then you've got to make everything fit that. Anything that contradicts it, you've got to come up with. It. And if, you, if, anybody, if anybody uses that, they're, they're mixing the old covenants. It's crazy lunacies people are coming up with. Um, look at verse 17 of chapter 5, 1 Timothy. It says, Let the elders that rule be what counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. In other words, the preachers. Those, in other words, those elders who, who had, as the church began to mature, had grown into ministry gifts. Understand, and, and back in the, when they first started the churches, a lot of times they would just put the older people in charge of the church. They'd get the church established and go on, but they, they didn't have, the pastors weren't developed. The churches were all new. We don't have that problem anymore. I said, we don't have that. That's, that, that's, that. that was one of the problems of the early church. But, so he says, that, let them, the, the, the elders, be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who are laboring in word, word and doctrine, those who are teaching the congregation. Amen. And then what did Paul say next? For the scripture, oh, well, he didn't have a Bible. <laughs> where, where did he get this from? For the scripture, what did he do? The old covenant is the basis of what they were preaching and revealing the new covenant. And so as Paul's letters were written and, and, and um, Luke wrote and Matthew wrote and John wrote and Peter wrote and James wrote and Jude wrote. <clears throat> Are you here? They were using the Old Testament as their basis and God was bringing revelation out of that and they quoted the old covenant to teach what they were teaching. And establish doctrine from the scripture. For what the, for the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Well, how about that? Deuteronomy 25, 4 talks about that they shall, you shall not muzzle the oxen. Y'all hear you go home. Well, that was scripture. That was their Bible. And they quoted that to substantiate or to undergird, uh, as the foundation or the undergirding of what they were teaching. Count them worthy of double honor, especially those labor worthy of deed, because the scripture says, do this in obedience to the scriptures. We got people saying, don't obey the Bible. We got people saying that there's no, there's no commandments in the New Testament. We got people saying you shouldn't have to do it, you don't have to do it. The Bible says you're under grace. These are all extreme positions. And, with the, and the sad thing is, those who are doing this with the grace of God, teaching some of these things and calling it the grace of God, are doing a disservice to the true grace of God. They're, called, they're, called, they're bringing a reproach on, on what is the real grace of God. Bible talks about there'll be, there'll be in Jude, the people will come in and turn, and, and turn the grace of God into licentiousness, lasciviousness in different translations. Basically, to, to live untamed and unbridled. But notice he said, he said, for the scripture saith. 1 Timothy 3.16, we read earlier, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I don't know how you can read that and say there's no New Testament commandments and we don't have to obey. When somebody told me once, I don't have to obey. <laughs> really? Wow. You know, somebody else told me, you don't, you don't, we don't examine, we don't judge ourselves. And then 1 Corinthians says, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And of course, here's the answer to that every time. We're only to judge ourselves to see if we're living in grace or not, so that we're not mixing the covenants. And I just, you know, I want to pull my hair out. But then again, I don't because I, I like keeping my hair. Hallelujah. Ah. Uh, James 2.8, if you fulfill the royal law, oh, that's that word law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. James 2.23, and the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. James 4.5, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the scripture that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Better not leave that one sitting out there, have we? Some of these are, you know, almost self-explanatory because you've heard them enough in the past. James 4, 5. James 4, 1. From whence cometh wars and fightings among ye? Come they not hence even of your own lust? 
that you war that war in your members. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have. Ye cannot attain. Ye fight and war. Yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your own lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship uh, that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain the spirit that, that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. Amen. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble. Oh my. So now there's a condition on receiving grace. I said there's a condition. He resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. So what's the condition? Humble yourself before God. Because he says he resists the proud. That went over big. Submit yourselves therefore. Why? Because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Resist, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Listen to this one. I, 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 this is another condition. Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. See, people use certain scriptures. God's omnipotent. I mean, God's omniscient. Nope. <laughs> Let me get it right. God's omnipresent. I got all my omnis mixed up. God's omnipresent. He's everywhere. You can't get any closer to God. Then why did James say, say draw nigh to God? If you can't get any closer to God. See, the scripture eliminates. The scripture eradicates dumb thinking. Or erroneous thinking. Or thinking that we just come up with because we feel like it ought to be so. There are people that believe that because God's a God of love, nobody goes to hell. Yeah, he, tells, he says. They're going to be cast in the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That death and hell are going to give up their dead. And be cast into the lake of fire uh, forever. Which is the second death. Oh, God's a God of love. See, they feel like because he's a God of love, he can't do it. They're, he's a God of love, he's also a God of justice. Hello. You know, and his love demands justice. So draw nigh, nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye you double minded. Humble, verse 10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he'll lift you up. Now look, back up here. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain? The scripture never says anything in vain. I've got people who believe. I know people who believe that it does not matter concerning your finances. Whether you tithe or give or sow or not, you are going to be blessed because you're under grace. Yet Paul writing to the church at Corinth clearly states, are you here? That every man is to give not grudgingly or of necessity for God loveth a cheerful giver. And then he goes on and says this in that same passage he says this. He says that every man receives according to that which he sows. He that, and listen, the scripture says, he that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Now what does that tell me? There is conditions on how much you get. There's no conditions. People tell me there's no conditions with God. Then why does his scripture say, and the scripture, that, well look over there. Y'all just kind of out there looking at me like, is that really in the Bible? Yes. It really is. Hallelujah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. You first Corinthians chapter six? Second nine six. Yeah, I was an eight. I, was, I got over to nine. Yeah, there we go. I've I seen stuff over in eight that I wanted to cover. If you go, if, starting in chapter eight at least, he starts talking about money. That's why I was an eight, because I knew he started over in eight, and I was trying to find why I wanted an eight, but here. 
Therefore, verse 5, I thought it necess necess uh, necessary to exhort the brethren. They will go before you, for unto you and make up beforehand your bounty. Money, M-O-N-E-Y. Whereof you had noticed before that after the same manner I might be ready as, ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall, also, shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his own heart or in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to, able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have an all sufficiency, and all things may abound in every good work. But listen, that is given in context. You having all grace, but you just can't pull this out and go, "Oh, God makes all grace abound to me that I'm having always having all sufficiency. I abound unto every good work." It's given in relationship with. You got to take it in context. It's not something you can pull out and just use anywhere as a blanket statement. It's giving in context with him first saying that what you receive back is based on how much you give. Whatever you determine, sparing or bountiful, it determines the return. Now God's able to make all grace abound towards you. That ye always have an all sufficient in all things and may abound to every good work. Now see there is an encouragement. See, here's the encouragement. Go ahead and give bountifully because God's able to make all grace abound towards you. And if you'll go ahead and, 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 and give a bountifully, God could give a, bount, I mean, a bountifully back to you and you're always having all sufficiency. But there is a condition on this that is a condition of how much you sow is how much you will reap. It's in direct relation and direct, it is proportional. Or in computer terms, it is vectored. All right? Some of you know, if, you, if you've got a graphic that's vector, that means when you, when you size it, it stays in exact ratio. No matter how you size it, it's always going to stay in the exact same ratios because it's vectored. If it's not vectored, you can pull it out and mess it all up. But if it's vectored, you can stretch it out. You can grab a corner and pull it down here, and everything's going to stay in the same ratio. And Paul vectors his statement here. And Paul makes it clear that how much you receive back was based on how much you determined to give in the beginning. There is a condition here. The scripture says, the scripture says, amen? Isn't that right? Amen. Hallelujah. The scripture says it. Now you can't come along here and pull out verse 8 and run down the road. Hello? I heard somebody tell me, I'll have to sow seed, okay? Verse 10. He that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown. Somebody said, yeah, I don't have to tithe, I don't have to tithe, I don't have to give, I don't have to sow, I don't have to go to church, I don't have to obey, I don't have to submit. Okay, well, let me ask you something here. How is he going to multiply your seed if it's not sown? He multiplies your seed. So this is why Scripture is so important. Because people make statements that you have to come out and take the whole counsel of Scripture and weigh everything against itself. Now, some, some people get so smart at they get they just get They just get obnoxious. I said something about, you know, uh, you know, that you have to take the full counsel of the Word of God. They said, well, how do you, I mean, because the, the, the Word of God balances itself. There is balance found within the Word itself. The whole counsel of the Word of God is fully balanced. Amen? Is that not right? There's a lot of food on the planet. Just forget all the artificial stuff. Forget about the fillers. Forget about the fast food. If you take all the food items on the planet that are given to us to eat. However, we as, as, as human beings need a well-balanced diet. In other words, we need foods from all the different food groups in proper proportion. Is that correct? To be a, have a healthy body and live a balanced, a, a balanced, healthy dietary life. If you go, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to eat Big Macs. <laughs> Forget Big Macs. I'm just going to eat uh, steaks. Just, I mean... No fillers, just get me some steaks, and all, all I eat is steak. You're getting no carbohydrates, you're getting no vegetables, you're getting, uh, you know, you're not getting any of the, of the vitamins that come from different vegetables. Are you here? You're not getting roughage from, from different grains. What have you got? You have 
part of a genuine and legitimate, a genuine and legitimate part of the food group. But it's not the whole council of the food group. In order to have a good, healthy life, you're going to need grains, whole grains. You're going to need green vegetables. You're going to need, are y'all here? You're going to need carbohydrates. I know that, you know, the evil carb. <laughs> what, was your, what was your evil carb guy called, Bill? He forgets the name of his evil carb guy from, from, from the low-carb nexus. But, but, but the little evil, little evil the carbs are evil. And uh, Michelle, you have to have carbohydrates. You have to have a certain amount. Even Atkins diet, you know, just did you that, that industrial thing. But then it said you eat carbohydrates until your body starts gaining weight. You just, that's your cutoff. But you, in other words, you weren't to deny yourself carbohydrates always. You needed a certain amount. It's just that you, you, you found a place where your body, what your body needed, and you quit taking them because that, that was, you know, then you got over, over beyond that. Which I can tell you, a two-liter drink a day is not how much you're supposed to have. A two-liter drink a day is not what you're supposed to have. <laughs> okay. All right. But you need the whole council of the food groups. Now, the, 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 the FDA keeps coming up with food pyramids, food squares, food b b b ovals. I mean, you know, they keep coming up with crazy stuff. Now, let's take that same ideology and apply it to the Word of God. You need the whole counsel of the Word of God. You don't just need love. You don't need to be some hippie up at Woodstock saying what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the one thing there's just too little love. We do need love, but you need faith. You just don't need faith. You need to understand the grace of God. You don't need just to understand grace, faith, and love. You need to understand uh, hope. It's role in your life. You need to understand uh, character, virtue. Amen? When you go read Peter's writing, he says, add to your faith. He goes down and lists all those things. He says, and if these things be in you and abound, you shall be, well. In 2 Peter chapter 1, I believe. Yeah. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brother, <laughs> brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they shall make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if thee, for if you do thee, these things you shall never fall. So Peter says, here's a balance of what you have to have. And when we take the Bible and we start studying the Word of God, then remember, what's our number one purpose for studying? Is to find how we can apply it to our life. It is not so you can go to work and tell the, the Baptist that you're Pentecostal and you speak in tongues and they're, they're going to go to hell if they say that the tongues is of the devil. That's not why you study the Bible. I mean, come on now. That's not the purpose. I'm going to tell you, you, you can fellowship with a Baptist about the new birth, John 3, 16, all day long. They'll shout with you just about it. They'll get so excited about the Lord, they'll just about shout, be shouting Baptist. Now, maybe not, you know, they'll, they'll even say amen in church. Especially if they've got a Southern Gospel Quartet singing, hallelujah. Get the slap in the knee. But that's, it's, not, it's not so we can do Scripture Wars. It is to make it applicable to our lives. To make our lives line up with the Word. Can somebody say amen? amen? Hallelujah. And so, the whole counsel of the Word of God. So, this person I was talking with, they go, they go along and they go, well, how do you balance the Holy Ghost? With the unholy ghost? No, you twit. You little smart mouth. Hmm. I was trying to be, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to cuss, isn't it? but I just want to say something unkind. Just really unkind. That is not balance. How do, you how do you balance faith with unbelief? No. I balance faith with faith without works is dead being alone. Hello? Yeah, there's action that goes with your faith. You just don't sit back and go, I'm in faith. <laughs> I know people, you, you, go, you go places, you, know, you, go, you could go to Tulsa, and uh, I mean, if somebody called 45 Raymond graduates, jumped out of some storefront somewhere and started casting the devil out of them. You know, they were all waiting on their ministry. 
Well, we've got to put some action with that somewhere. Hello? Go get involved in a church and help somebody. Get involved in ministry, doing something. I'm waiting on my ministry. God's waiting on you. Go do something. Help somebody. Be a blessing. Amen? But faith without works. So to preach, when you preach faith, you know, we confess, we believe, we declare. The number one way to release our faith is to say it. Yes, but then faith without works is dead being alone. If you really believe something, you're going to act like it. Now, how many have ever seen people, men or women, who thought they were either really handsome or really hot? And you look at them and think, my God, what are they thinking? They just believe there's something else. I've seen some women, dear Lord, have mercy, come walking out in something that needs to be on Twiggy. Are you here? And they were the, the, the inspiration for doing the, the Bertha Butts boogie. Y'all remember that one, don't you? How many remember the Bertha Butts boogie song? Nobody, Deneen, please tell me you remember the Bertha Butts boogie. Yeah, sure. Montreal? You never heard boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, boom. All right, anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. They're convinced they're hot. Yeah. And so they act like it. They wear stuff that, you know, that they should have given up six sizes ago. Y'all here? I mean, they got every role showing. I mean, they got it tucked tight, baby. I mean, they have, they have crammed themselves in there, and they call it, they is hot. <laughs> I saw a girl today, I went to carry Janie lunch over, the, over at school, and she had on skin-tight leggings. Now, Lord have mercy. You know, I mean, at least all black leggings help you know, make you look slimmer. She had on, she didn't have on like, you know, really anything really long to cover it up. She, like, she, I think she had on a shirt, maybe covered up a little bit on the back side. She had on these patterned leggings. Well, we know patterns make you look bigger. That's just, that's just, uh, you know, rule of, of dressing. And I don't like to think, well, but she thought she was something else, baby. I mean, she's strutting. Now, see, she thought, she thought she was, so she acted like that. When you believe something, you should act a certain way. And as a Christian, as a believer, when you're in faith about something, you should be acting a certain way. Now, you don't act that way to get into faith. The action should be a response or a result of your faith. But faith without works is dead being alone. Amen. Well, I'm praying for the sick. Or, no, no, I'm praying for the hungry. And they show up at your door. And they, the Bible says, if you say to them, be warned and be filled and send them on their way, you really haven't acted in faith. Thank you. So the scripture becomes the means whereby we understand. Remember our, our, what we read there from 2 Timothy earlier, 3.16? That all scripture is given by inspiration of God as God breathed. Holy men of old wrote as the breath of God came on them. They did not write by personal inspiration. The Bible says, uh, Peter says this. He says, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Wow. It was God breathed. It's the breath of God that moved on them. They wrote by inspiration the breath of God. Well, who's the breath of God? Remember about the, the Holy Spirit is, is the holy pneuma in the Greek. Pneuma, the breath, the wind, the spirit. It's God breathed. It's God's spirit came on them. They wrote the prophecy of the scripture. They wrote by inspiration the mind and the will and the counsel of God. Now, anybody can come along and say this isn't, this isn't God's word when the scripture itself validates it as breath of God. How dare you come and say the word of God, the scripture is not the word of God. Who do you think you are? It fits their narrative. It's a dangerous place. Why is it so important? Because we remember, we said from Timothy that it's good for doctrine. You know you need to know what you believe and why you believe it? Yeah. Pastor Ed said, that don't mean nothing. Show up at the devil and try that one. Well, Pastor Ed said, 
But what happened? The same thing that happened to the seven sons of Sceva. Hello? There were certain, there were certain vagabonds with seven sons of one Sceva who found a man who was demon, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, then I'm going to get back into it, demon possessed, and they said, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth to come out. And the demon said, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? And whooped them, and they fled the house butt naked. Hello? <clears throat> it's, not a, you, you, it's not enough to know what Pastor Ed told you. Hello? That won't, that won't help you. Oh, Pastor Ed said, Brother Hagen said. Brother Hagen, you should get on people about that. Don't you go out there and say, I said it. You get in the Word, and you find out for yourself, and then you say, I know it because I know what the Bible says. He didn't, he didn't agree with people doing that. Well, Brother Hagen said, so what? You understand, I love Dad Hagen. Appreciate his ministry. His ministry blessed my life, changed my life. But not because I couldn't, there's not a battle I've ever won where I went and said, now, according to what Dad Hagen said, 1 Peter 2, 24 says, I believe. I have to go now, according to what 1 Peter 2, 24 says, I believe. The ministers point you in the direction. They share things with you to point you in the direction. But you've got to go find out for yourself. You've got to be a student of the Word of God for yourself. Amen? But again, getting back to this point, the Scripture is imperative because it keeps us from getting wacky. It's profitable for our doctrine. It's profitable to rebuke you or approve you. Because people come along and they start saying, <laughs> one couple was at a church excuse me I'm, I'm the um, district director over the pastor and, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a, and I'm, I'm over him but just, just for, for organizational purposes I'm his district director Past a couple came to his church and said we're having problems with our relationship and got talking to him and says well, well are you guys living together they said yeah he said, that might be why you're having problems in your relationship. Oh, no, Pastor, we're under grace. That doesn't matter. Yeah. See, that's where reproof comes in. Because the Scripture has to reprove that thinking. Well, the Bible says that, the, that, that fornicators won't inherit the kingdom of God. You're, you're in fornication. Oh, I'm under grace. No, 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 no. You can't take a, something and just dis, discount another Scripture. That's where the Scripture balances itself. Well, we're under grace. Yeah, you're under, you, maybe you're under grace, but you're violating the grace. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And then the Scripture reproves that activity, and you've got to repent and change and stop doing it. It's profitable to correct. You think you're going the right way, but then the Word of God says, no, no, this is what, this is what oh, I, make, I, need, I need to make a correction of my life because the Bible says this. Hello? Now, here you go home. You see, now there's nothing wrong with making jokes. We, you know, we got so serious back in the six, 70s and 80s that we couldn't even joke. I, I don't jest. Jesting is evil. The Bible says foolish jesting. What's foolish jesting? There are, there are things that, that cross the line that are, un, that are ungodly, that are, that are reproaches. That's foolish jesting. But they'll be joking around like 283 and counting with a K. I mean, after Coach K won his 900 and whatever it was, his second, first, what, what gave him the record, Larry? 903, 901, 902, what was it? Whatever it was, every time they won a game since then, Josh has sent me a message. I didn't get one last night, but I, got, I get a message. 9-0 whatever and counting with a K, because Coach K's name is with a K. So last night he got one. 283 and counting. That's the losses. <laughs> <laughs> so you can play this guy. You keep up with the wins, I'll keep up with the losses. We'll just keep up with his record. <laughs> Amen. Now that's just, that's just playing around. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But to be, be um, crude, crass, curt, ungodly in jesting, that's, that's foolish jesting. Telling dirty jokes, that's foolish jesting. Christians had no business doing that. 
Hello. I remember my, my eighth grade um, history and social studies teacher came in one day. And we're, we're all in there. You got unsaved, a bunch of unsaved kids. And we're all just young. He said, y'all want to hear a dirty joke? And everybody goes, yeah, the teacher's going to tell a dirty joke. He said, the white horse fell in the mud. Of course, it, it wasn't happy. But anyway, they thought, oh, we're going to get, the teacher's going to be, be whatever. Yeah, the teacher shouldn't be messing around with that stuff anyway. But foolish jesting. We got so, we got so whatever about stuff you couldn't foolish. Well, you couldn't jest at all. I'm sorry. That's just, that's extreme. You, you, you don't go to Raymond. They, they, they play practical jokes with each other all the time at Raymond. I'm talking about staff. All the time there's stuff going on. They're playing practical jokes. And they're, and they're just funny and they're fun. They're not, they're not crass and they're not crude and they're not uh, whatever. Okay? So we have to balance that with, with foolish and, 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 and you know, and, and what, what really jesting is. I got off on that for some reason. It was good anyhow. Uh, 283 and counting. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I'm, I'm sure Larry is going looking up Coach um, uh, Roy's record. Yeah. See, but see, when we spell counting, we spell it properly. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So let's, let's wrap it up here. Um, we, we may pick up some more of this next week. <coughs> um, the scriptures are, are important to your knowledge of God. Now, if God breathed them, if God inspired them, then they are important. I I submit to you that if God breathed them for men to write, then they are important. Amen. And they are not to be laid aside because we have the Spirit of God in us. As a matter of fact, you go listen to some of these old timers that when God spoke to them about by the Holy Ghost to do something, the Spirit of God would take them to the Scriptures to validate what the Spirit of God told them. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And you need a basis for faith that is valid. Amen. Well, praise God.